Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the first gospel in the New Testament. It comes from the 13th chapter, beginning with the 44th verse. Hear these words from the gospel writer. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So ends our scripture reading this morning. Good morning. On this Sunday of joy and pink, I love it. Um, I was wondering if you had a memory of the first time that you bought something that was very expensive that you worried about. Now, I don't mean like, when I was younger, I got like a bike. When I was in sixth grade, the, in our community in Arcadia, the thing you did was you got a bike from the bike shop and then you, you biked all the way home from the bike shop and that was, that was kind of the big deal. Um, and I know we all get cars and some of us have houses, um, but I mean something small like jewelry, like the first time you got an engagement ring, right? When you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? I don't ever take it off. I had a friend who took off her engagement ring at Macy's, put some hand lotion on, looked up, and it was gone. True story. Um, but the thing that I the first remember, the first memory I have of being an adult in my 20s, old enough to purchase something that was a big deal, was when I was a full-time teacher in the 90s. I bought a PDA. Does anyone remember what that is? Right? PDA, right? Does anyone remember that? Um, it means personal digital assistant. And it was super fancy at that time, at that time, about the mid to late 90s. Um, I got the Palm Pilot, does anyone remember that? Palm Pilot PDA. And it came with this little stylus pen, and I just thought I was it. I thought technology is never gonna get better than this. It just isn't. But I remember also thinking that I hold something in my hand worth hundreds of dollars, like worth a lot of money to me at that time when I was a teacher. And so, you know, I carried it and took it with me, but it made me a little paranoid as well. Like I wanted to make sure I had it and it was safe. Um, I have this really funny, terrible sort of memory of traveling. Uh, I was with my parents. We were at a hotel in London. I'd just gotten my PDA. For some reason, I needed to bring it with me to Europe. I don't know why. It didn't make calls. It didn't take pictures. And so, but there was something wrong with my hotel room. It was a posh hotel, it was a nice hotel. So the maintenance guy came up, we went down to breakfast, and I came back up to my room and I couldn't find it. And I thought, oh my gosh, my heart dropped to my stomach. And I thought, where's my Palm Pilot? Where did it go? And I called the security, I called the manager of the hotel. I was panic stricken until we realized I'd just hidden it really well in my suitcase. So some poor maintenance guy, man, probably for a little bit of time, thought he was a little bit accused of stealing my PDA. And I remember thinking like, I hid it so well that I couldn't even find it. I'm sure no one would take it. We all have things, treasures, that are priceless to us. Oftentimes we play the game of, you know, if something happened, if there was a storm or a fire, something happened in your house, what would you take out with you? And you can think about those things, those things that are priceless, those things that have, you know, sentimental value, those things that have market value. Um, we all have treasures. And so thinking about during Christmas, the things that we buy, the treasures, the gifts that we given, I think this, these two parables are very, very interesting. Because we come to talk about these parables together today. And these parables are both about stuff about treasures, about buying something, about finding something, about valuing something. It seems fitting in the midst of shopping. Raise your hand if you've done all your shopping yet. No, I have a hand, that is awesome. The rest of us are like, oh, no. So we have two valuable items in this parable. We have a treasure, we have a pearl. 
The treasure is found by accident. In fact, I've always been a little suspicious of that parable, right? The treasure is unexpected. It's also a little bit suspect, like a plumber that finds money hidden in a house and then instead buys the house instead of telling the owners, right? Because he wants to keep the treasure. Uh, a little bit hokey. But we don't get those details. Jesus is not concerned with that. The pearl is found after much searching by an expert. In fact, you and I might not see the value of the pearl, but the merchant in the story does. Here you have someone who knows the value that he seeks, finds it, and does the same thing as the plowman in the other one, sells everything with joy to find it and acquire it for himself. Parables are supposed to hit you sideways. They're kind of like tricksters in that way. So what are we supposed to learn about the kingdom of God through these two parables that Jesus told his disciples about joy and about finding and about fields and about treasures and about pearls? And these, mind you, are not big crowd parables. There's some, there's some parables where you can imagine Jesus speaking to a large crowd of people saying something of deep value and truth. No, this was told just to his closest disciples, if the in crowd, if you will. So what is he trying to tell them? Well, there's a couple things of context you know I like to give you. One is the notion of the pearl was often a descriptor in the ancient world for something that was very, very valuable. Like how De Beers has sort of made diamonds very valuable for us, right? There's all these commercials. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Um, diamonds are status. Diamonds are, you know, kind of where it is. For in the ancient world, that would have been pearls. Um, since there weren't always safe places to store treasures, hiding in a field, ironically to us, seems like a terrible idea. But back then, when there were no safes, no, no banks, really, um, of any kind, that's where you would hide something. You would hide something and hopefully go back to find it. Now, sometimes you didn't go back to find it because something happened on your way back to getting it. Um, sometimes you maybe forgot where it was. But it's interesting that who finds these invaluable treasures, this pearl and this treasure, those with expertise and those without expertise both find something immensely valuable. Because remember, treasures are only treasures because someone says they're valuable. Think about it. Pearls are just sand and oyster spit. <laughs> right? An annoyed oyster made a pearl. We make it valuable. And these stories have these cycles, these lovely cycles that actually mirror a bit of us advent. The waiting, the expectancy, the searching the aha moment, the finding, and then the dramatic reversal of fortunes, the buying, the purchasing, the getting, the acquiring. The kingdom of God brings about the reversal of values, leading to the crucial action of obtaining the new values at any cost, a very over-the-top response that people with old values don't recognize. Because think about selling everything you have. Can you eat a plural? Can you pay rent with a pearl? No. So it's not literal. It's this over hyperbole, over the top idea of how we're supposed to value the things that God values. It's this reversal of fortune. It's this new way of seeing things. It's that Jesus is saying, the thing that I bring to you is so valuable. You will want to sell everything to obtain it. And it's crazy to us to think about it. In fact, in our world, we see crazy things all the time. Sometimes there's a mother whose son was murdered, and she publicly forgives that murderer. And you think, that is crazy. That is the craziest thing I've ever heard. And we say, why? And it, and it is kind of strange. But what you realize is that she's bought a pearl of peace. She has let go of bitterness. She has purchased something beyond price. Today marks the second anniversary of what happened at Sandy Hook Elementary School. And as much as it was a terrible, horrible time, unimaginable tragedy, the stories of the school staff who did such heroic things still resonate with me and reminds me that even in the midst of difficulty and terribleness, people can have these selfless, self-giving ways about them. And we look and we go, oh my gosh, that must be God. That's amazing, that's a value. It's the striking image recently we've seen of Richmond police chief Chris Magnus holding a sign and standing with the protesters holding a sign that says Black Lives Matter. 
It is the image of 12-year-old Devante Hart hugging Portland Sergeant Brett Barnum with tears streaming down his face during the Portland protest. It's these images that defy our logic, that are beautiful reminders of the alternate value that God brings to us and this world. There are always the Mother Teresas and the Martin Luther King Juniors. They give up affluence or safety for things they believe in, dignity for the poor and dying, racial equality. And we oftentimes think, that could never be me. That's too extreme. Well, it's not going to be all of us. But the good news of this parable is that it is you, and it can be you tomorrow. It is you because you are here, right? Despite slogging it in and out day in your job, being tired, still having uh, apparently a lot of shopping to do, <laughs> school shopping errands, kids throwing temper tantrums, teenagers who don't like to get out of bed early on a Sunday because they wake up really early during the week, by the way. You came here. And whether it's once a month or twice a month, we see you and embrace you in this community, and I am glad you're here, because it's an oddly very countercultural thing to do these days, to spend an hour or more in a church service or in a church committee caring about the things that God cares about. You come here because you want to encounter God, and you want to leave changed, and I think that's a miracle. And maybe beyond that, you give some of your time and money to invest in this place. You, give, you come and you come to meetings, because I know we all love meetings, right? We have boards who do amazing work. Do you know that half of the people, on, adults on our youth board, don't even have youth in the program? They care about your teenagers that much, that they're willing to sacrifice their time, because they care about youth that aren't even theirs. And today after church, you might buy a gift at the alternative Christmas fair. I grew up having them when I was um, a, you know, a young person at the church that my parents took me to. And today you might buy a gift that will not benefit you at all. Isn't that weird? Isn't that crazy? You're going to buy a gift for someone that you will never meet in a place that you might never go that will give them water, that will give them shelter, that will give them rescue, that will give them healing and wholeness. And you can do that today. That's a miracle. That is alternative values and an alternative fair. If you brought Christmas giving tree gifts or you helped out in any way, you gave a gift to 10 families that you will never meet. Charlie Balding, Jackson Greer, and I met six of those families this week when we dropped off the gifts on Tuesday. One of the families was represented by a grandmother who I was told was wearing shoes she got out of the garbage can. These gifts will be the only gifts she's given to her children and grandchildren in six years for Christmas. And if you bought those gifts, she wants to say thank you. She was so blessed and she was touched that it was our youth that did it. She said, the youth are the future, and I'm so proud of you all. Thank you so much. That is amazing. That is strange. That is out there, that we give gifts and we do things continually for other people, and that we're challenged in the church and our Christian faith to do that. But let me tell you the twist, the sideways angle in these two parables. The twist is that not only are we looking at those kingdom values and they're shaking each other up and shaking our own lives and our own hearts and our own values up, but the twist is that you are the pearl and you are the treasure. And that I'm the pearl and that I'm the treasure. And that God is the merchant. God is the one who finds the treasure. God gladly gives up all to invest in us. God finds joy in us. God sees us as so valuable that he purchases us at an amazing price. We call him Savior, saving us from ourselves. The Christmas story goes that God leaves the lofty heavenly abode and comes to us in the form of a helpless infant whose teenage unwed mother was poor and without privilege, virtually homeless, a refugee in a strange land. Jesus is a common name, not of course as common as Fred, for those of you who are at the play, but still common. He came from what they would describe as the ghetto. He came from Nazareth. And the saying goes that nothing good comes from Nazareth. 
There was no pride in being born in Nazareth. Jesus was a minority in a harsh society governed by Roman occupation. And God gave up all of that privilege to come and restore and reconcile humanity and live in our midst to show us the way, the way of grace and love and mercy and generosity, that God extends God's self. God doesn't create little pockets of people who are just God is for me. God's extravagantly open and welcoming in the way Jesus was. And Jesus did that for us. God cares so much about us that he came down to do that. And so we are that pearl and we are that treasure. And the challenge is that that can be you. It is you and it can be you. Everyone is a treasure and a value of great price. Whatever tribe you instinctively associate with politically, religiously, sociologically, economically, racially, culturally, those people who are not in your tribe, guess what? They're pearls and treasures too. They're pearls and treasures too. And let me say it in a way that's even more challenging for us. There's been a lot of, um, the, through the Ferguson and, and New York grand jury decisions, there's been a lot of hoopla going around. And whatever side you find yourself on of that protest, whatever side, and I know in this church there are people on both sides of that protest, that my challenge to you is I want you to look at the people on the other side as pearls and treasures as well. Because God has called all of us to care about people in the way he does, to value humanity, to value our, feather, our, our fellow brother and sister in Christ, to, to value those people around us, our neighbors, our coworkers, the people that we, we don't agree anything with. He's called us to value them like a pearl of great price, like a treasure in a dusty field, that they are that treasure the same way we are. And we find joy because God first found joy in us. Because the, the parable goes that both the merchant and the, the guy that we don't even hear who he is in the field go and with great joy and excitement sell everything they have to gain this new treasure. A blogger named Beth, who's a pastor in a rural community, maybe not unlike Nazareth, wrote this poem in response to these two parables. She says, <clears throat> what on earth is the kingdom of God? Is it the place where the rich can buy their way in and where the poor don't need it? Is it the upside down place where youth can have wisdom and adults can have foolishness? Is that nameless place within each one of us yearning to be filled with we know not what? Yet it is the place that is not a place at all. It is a destination we've already arrived at, a state of grace with acts of mercy and love what is the kingdom of God, she asks. It is the buried treasure that someone would find and hide to find, keeping it all for himself. It is the pearl of great price, beauty and perfection and symmetry that someone would sell all to obtain. It's that worthwhile at any price, at any risk. But whose price, whose risk? Tradition would suggest that Jesus' parables are a challenge to us. Sell all you have and follow me. Risk all you have to be with me. Gather in all you have and throw your lot in with me. I am the investment you seek, cries Jesus. I am the sure thing. The treasure you already know is there. The pearl whose value you already have. I am that for which you've waited a lifetime. But it can also be a challenging parable. If we assume that we're the shoveler, the buyer of land with insider knowledge, of a, of a plot of land that was not ours, diggers for our own advantage, taking that which someone else has laid up, keeping it a secret, hoarding that extravagant find. But, but, what if God is the person in that field, digging not for God's own sake, but for ours, selling all, risking all, to find, to have, to hold? Who? Us. If God is the merchant, Maybe we are the, the treasure, the value thing that God invests everything to find in us. Treasure is only as valuable as we think it is. It's only as valuable as we all agree it is. It is in the eye of the beholder that gives a pearl its great value. To an oyster, it's nothing but an annoyance to be dealt with. To the merchant, a breathtaking treasure to be cared for and loved. It is unrealized potential sitting in the palm of his hand. 
So let us consider anew, friends, who is the digger of the treasure? Who is that merchant? Is it us? Is it us seeking? Or is it God seeking us? already aware of the value because the only value has always laid in God's eyes and that value is us. Don't forget, friends, God has searched for a pearl of great price, joyfully sold everything to buy it. God has found a treasure hidden in a field and joyfully sold everything to possess it, joyfully, sacrificially, unbelievably. And that pearl and that treasure is you. Amen.